Well, hi, New Life Covenant Church. It's uh, having so much fun having church here all by myself and uh, having to view this uh, later on on TV. But thank you for your support and thank you for your many, many comments. And to those watching around the world, again, we can't uh, express our appreciation enough for your support and uh, for your encouragement. We so appreciate that. Uh, for New Life Covenant Church members, let's just keep on hanging in there. Let's uh, stay together. We've got a building to build, a church to dedicate. Uh, we have a congregation to maintain, and we keep on rolling. We thank God for uh, all of his grace and the wonders that he's performed. Uh, the last few weeks I've been talking to you on uh, the kingdom of God. Today I'm going to uh, go on with that. My message is entitled today, uh, process of the kingdom or processes of the kingdom. The kingdom of God has various processes in which it functions in. And uh, I want to read a scripture for you from the book of Galatians, chapter number 6, verse 11 through 18. Uh, Paul says to them, You see such a large letter I've written to you with my own hand. He said, as many as desire to make a show of uh, themselves in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised or demand you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer per persecution for the cross. And then he says, verse 13, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may be glorified in the flesh. And then he says, this is leaven. He says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, talking about the leaven of Galatia. And so he's here dealing with a certain series of processes. When we're dealing with the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is a process. It's one step upon another. It's a line upon line. It's like climbing a ladder. You don't go from the bottom rung of the ladder to the tenth rung with one step. You have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's like a scale in music. It's not uh, jumping from one note to the eighth note. It's going from one note to the next. Everything is in steps. We start as a child, we grow to an adult. We start with milk, we go to meat. We start with a seed, we go to a full tree that produces fruit, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's an entire process. And so in this teaching, the process of the kingdom, I have five different subjects we'll be dealing with in the process of the kingdom. Process number one is circumcision. Process number two is wine. Process number three, the wine skin. Process number four, olive oil or anointing oil. And process number five, the making of bread and dealing with leaven. So let's start with the first one, circumcision. Uh, Paul wrote the letter to the Galatian church because of the issue of circumcision. Uh, many Gentiles started getting saved, and so the Jewish Christians began to make a demand that circumcision uh, be imposed upon the Gentiles as a means of salvation. Now, the first initial circumcision is in the book of Genesis when God made a covenant with Abraham. And he said to Abraham, as a sign of my covenant with you, I want all the males in your camp, even your servants, all the males to be circumcised. And that's the foreskin of the male organ to be cut off as a sign that you are in covenant. And so every covenant has three things. There's the promise of the covenant, and then there are the benefits of the covenant, the blood of the covenant, and then the sign of the covenant. So the sign of the covenant God made with Noah is the rainbow. Uh, the sign of our covenant uh, with Jesus Christ is baptism. When we are baptized, the Bible says in, in Colossians, that baptism is circumcision. And so when Paul is writing to the Galatian church, he's saying, you guys, we started in the spirit. You can't now demand that the Gentile men be circumcised he said circumcision may be uh, now in the New Testament uh, an issue of hygiene, but it's not an issue of, of salvation. 
And he said, because circumcision will profit you absolutely nothing. And so when we look at the process of circumcision here, it's the cutting of the flesh. Uh, it was also in some places the cutting of the ear where a slave would put a mark in their ear to endear themselves uh, or to endow themselves to their master for the rest of their lives. Uh, it's also the cutting and naming of a thing because when a gen Jewish boy was circumcised on the eighth day, on that day the boy was named. And so that name then is initially recognizing you into the purpose of God. And so, for example, God changed Abram's name from Abram to Abraham. And then Jacob had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. Uh, and all of those are signs of God moving in a different kind of a way. And so when you are baptized, uh, there's a circumcision that takes place, not of the flesh, it's a circumcision of the heart. And in that circumcision, you are renamed. My name is Tudor John Petit Bismarck. My mom named me. Apparently, she was a maid uh, in her teenage years and looked after a little boy, a Jewish boy whose name was Tudor. And she loved that boy, and she said, one day when I have a child, I'll name my child Tudor. Uh, and so my name is from a Scandinavian root name, Theodore, which, mean, which means God is here. And so Tudor then is the derivative of the name Theodore. I'm not sure what your name is or what your name means. Uh, we thank God for the name you've been given. Uh, just parents, remember that when you name your children, remember that they got to write their name in school at an exam and kids can uh, tease each other with their names. But whatever your name is, when you are baptized, you are renamed in Christ. You are given a heavenly name. And you become part of the name of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That is Jesus. We become Tudor Bismarck Jesus. You become Diana Vlahakis Jesus. Tammy Bima Jesus. And so as we process uh, the process of circumcision, what does that mean? It means that the heart of an individual, which is a heart of flesh, the works of the flesh are cut off. The ability and the willingness and the readiness to, to work in the flesh is circumcised. In the New Testament church, your heart is cut. It's now cut towards the, the works of holiness, the desires to be righteous, the desires to walk upright. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 5 and verse 48, Be you perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And perfection comes in stages. And so if you look at a plant, it's perfect as a seed. And then it's perfect as a little plant. It's perfect as a bush. It then becomes perfect with branches, perfect as it bears its own fruit. All of those are stages of perfection. I've been a Christian from 1972. I can't expect somebody who gets saved this week to be in a state of perfection as I am as a Christian for almost 47, 48 years. And so we then are expected in our levels of growth to be perfect. And uh, so your heart then determines that. Your desire in your heart determines that. Desire after holiness, Paul said. Desire after godliness. Desire after goodness. Desire after the purposes and the principles of God. The second process, then, is the process of wine making. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 48, there's a whole process there that Jeremiah deals with in terms of wine making. And uh, uh, when wine is actually made, firstly, the, the ground has to be prepared where a grape a vine is, is planted, usually by a slip. That means a grape is cut a grapevine is cut and a slip is planted in the ground. And then that vine becomes an independent vine, grows on generally uh, a stand or a, a vine maze that's built, and the vine begins to crawl. Uh, in covered gardens in the UK, there's a vine there that's almost 200 years old and still exists and still produces grapes 
uh, not as prolific as it, as it used to, but it's still there. Uh, and so you become now part of the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. That's John chapter number 15. And so as a vine, you prepare the ground, the vine is planted, the vine then grows, then spreads, then produces grapes. Usually the first harvest of grapes aren't that great, maybe even for eating. But then as the grapes, as the vine begins to uh, mature, it begins to produce more mature grapes. The grapes are then uh, harvested. Usually they will be uh, harvested by hand, put into uh, buckets or vats, and uh, that first grape juice would be poured. It was special. It became grapes that were bumping each other. And as the grapes were bumping each other, juice was pouring out. That was a special wine that uh, was preserved. The grapes then would be poured into a wine press where men and women who would then go on the wine press and step on the grapes. Uh, Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. And so as the grapes were being squashed by a person stamping on them, that wine would begin to come out, the grape juice would begin to come out and would run. It would then be put into what was called a wine vat or a lee, L-E-E. -E. And so that lee would be kept there for seven days. On the seventh day, at the end of the seventh day, it had to be poured out into another lee. All the particles and all the little lumps from the grapes will have gone and settled down. It had to be poured out on the seventh day. If it was the sixth day, it's too early. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of perfection. If it went to the eighth day, it was too late because then those um, lumps and particles of the grape on the bottom would begin to ferment and then the wine or the grape juice would turn into vinegar. Uh, vinegar is a stagnation limited uh, liquid. Vinegar is a preservative. Vinegar shows you where you were and preserves you at the state you were. And so when God says to, uh, to Moab, I have ought against you because you've not been poured out in the lees, he's talking about the wine process, how the wine has to be poured into another lee, another vat. And so seven days poured out again. Seven days poured out again. That is done for 49 days, seven consecutive weeks. And then on the 49th day, that wine is then released. On the 50th day, which is Jubilee, that is now officially called new wine. And so to be a wine, uh, as Paul, as uh, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, when they said, these guys are drunk because they were speaking in tongues and going crazy and falling out and staggering, all 120 of them, those men said, you men are drunk. And Peter said, we are not drunk as you suppose. We are drunk, yes, but not as you suppose. And what he was talking about was that that 50th day, Pent Pentecost is the 50th day from uh, the day of Passover. That 50th day, the new wine was celebrated. And so when the Holy Spirit was poured out, it was new wine being given. And the thing is that new wine has to be poured into a new wineskin. I pray that God would move you from just being grape juice to becoming a literal wine. Because if you're grape juice, you, you can still decay and, and, and rot. But when you become wine and you are sealed in a wine bottle or in a wine skin, that wine can stay for years and even centuries. And I'll get to that in the next process of wine. Uh, the next process of, of uh, the kingdom is now the wine skin. When the wine is poured on the 50th day into a wine skin or a wine bottle, the wine bottle has to be prepared. So let's deal with the bottle first. Uh, the bottles are usually made of glass or sometimes of clay. They would have to be sterilized. Usually the sterilization process would be in boiling water, uh, sometimes with salt in that boiling water to make sure that all germs, uh, all bacteria is removed. And that would be done uh, seven days in a row, seven days in a row. And then on the last day, fresh water gushing on that boiling water, gushing on that 
would then prepare that and then the wine put into the bottle and then sealed. And then that wine could stay for centuries. The second process is the wine skin. And the wine skin is pretty amazing because the wine skin, uh, Jesus said, you know, you can't uh, put new wine into old bottles or wine skins. The wine skin is pretty f uh, fascinating because its journey starts off with the animal. The animal is, is raised, usually in wi a wild animal or a goat, and then uh, the skin would then be put out to dry and then sewed up into a wine skin. And then the wine skin, once it was dried and prepared into the form of a, some sort of a bottle, they would then pump on the 50th day that wine into the bottle and seal it. And then the wine would then begin to expand and ferment, and it would stretch the skin to its max. And once it was stretched to its max, then that wine could be kept for years and years and years. But once the wine was poured out, the wine skin was useless. But the way they would then process the wine skin, they would then take the wine skin, put it in water, which is a type of the word of God, is the washing of water by the word. Dip that in for seven days. Then they would take it out after seven days. It would now be very uh, sort of palatable and slimy. They would then for seven days, seven times a day, they would massage that thing with olive oil. Seven times a day will I praise thee, O Lord. Seven times a day will I praise thee. Psalm 119. They would massage that thing with olive oil seven times a day for seven days. Then after seven days, after it was ready, they would then pound it with stones again, which is praise. My praises will not be limited. After they pound it with stones again, they then massage it with olive oil again, and then they let it set for seven days. By that time, we'd come now to the 49th day when the wine was actually ready, and they pumped that wine into an old wine skin that was reprocessed. And so you as a person, as a Christian, you're an old wine skin. Uh, when you become a Christian, you are pounded by the word. You are then soaked and washed by the word, sterilized by the word. You become the salt of the earth. Uh, you then uh, massage with olive oil. That's the Holy Spirit working in you, removing through the process of uh, sanctification. And then that wine is put in you, and you become a wine that can be distributed. And everybody that comes into your world becomes inebriated by the kinds of things you are done. And I pray that God will cause you to constantly be reinventing yourself and becoming a new wineskin for new revelation that God gives. And then we have the process of olive oil. The process of olive oil is one I really like. Uh, when Jesus was about to be crucified, he went from uh, the supper table. The Bible says he went to Gethsemane. And uh, the first group of disciples were in one place. That was eight of them. Another three went with him a little further. And then he went by himself. And he was right underneath the main olive trees. The first group of disciples that fell asleep, those eight were the courtyard. They could only go that far. The anointing was only limited to the courtyard. The other three, Peter, James, and John, they'd been in special places with Jesus uh, in Jairus' uh, daughter's house, uh, also on the Mount of Transfiguration and other places because they had an anointing that was much higher. And Jesus had the highest anointing. He was the biggest of all the olives. He was in the last place all by himself. And that deep prayer he was praying that caused him to sweat and bleed it was actually the process of making anointing oil. He was an olive that was being crushed. To make olive oil, the tree has to be planted, the tree has to grow, and uh, you, they don't pick olives because if you pick an olive, if you pull it off a tree, the olive becomes bitter and you can't use the oil. The olive has to fall to the ground, except a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. And so the way they harvest olives, the tree has to be shaken. And so when Jesus was in the Garden of Eden, or rather in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was being shaken, fell to the ground, and then the pressing begins. They would then take the olives, 
the olives bumping each other would then produce what is called light virgin oil that was used for perfumes and so on. Then there would be the first press, just a gentle press. That gentle press was oil that would be used for uh, the body. And then there's the second press. That oil would be used for things like cooking and preparing food and so on. And then there's another press. That oil would be then used for lighting lamps, uh, making lamp oil. And then there was the final press where there was a total crushing of the olive and crushing of the seed. And that oil would be used for uh, animal feed and so on and so forth. And so Jesus was crushed very gently to all the way we was totally crushed to make the purest anointing oil. And when that anointing hits you, uh, Isaiah said in 10, 29 of the book of Isaiah, that, that when that anointing hits you, it breaks and destroys yokes. And so the anointing on your life, when you say like Jesus said in 418 of Luke, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, that anointing breaks yokes. No matter how many chains you have, no matter how many uh, uh, locks that you've been placed in or stocks that the devil has kept you in, that anointing oil hits you, it breaks chains, it breaks generational curses. It can go back literally millenniums, all the way back to Adam if we have to, to break those chains. And I pray that that anointing oil hits your life. And I pray that God will use you mightily with the anointing on your life. Uh, for those that are in ministry, there's a greater expectation on your life uh, than others. And I pray that you'll be willing to go through all those crushings and those pressings to produce the kind of wine, uh, uh, oil, anointing, to break on people's lives, to break curses on people's lives. And the reason we use oil to pray for people is generally olive oil. It's very expensive, hard to get. It's just generally oil. Even if you just have ordinary cooking oil, you can use that oil and pray for the sick and pray for those if you are authorized by your church to do so. That oil, he anoints my head with oil. When that oil comes all, all the way down, Everything that's holding you back has to be broken. And then the process of bread, the way bread and, uh, is made. Firstly, we'll deal with wheat. Uh, wheat is actually, the ground has to be plowed, and you'll find Elisha plowing. Anything that begins in your life, the, the ground has to be plowed. The stones have to be moved, because if the seed falls on the wayside, if the seed falls on stony ground, if the seed falls amongst thorny ground, the seed will not prosper. All the harvest is lost. The seed has to fall on good ground. 30, 60, 100. Eight disciples, three disciples, the holiest of all is Jesus. So your seed has to fall in a good place. The seed that you have must not be squandered by wayside people and wayside agendas and wayside lifestyle. Mustn't be stuck in stones where you have uh, obstacles in your life. Those must be moved so you can get a harvest in your life or be stifled by thorns and thistles, which are all kinds of systems and people holding you back. Make sure that your wheat grows where there can be a harvest. Jesus said, a sower sowed the seed and sprinkled it everywhere. The birds of the air mustn't take your seed. I pray that your seed will go into good ground and come up and produce a harvest. Now. Once the wheat is harvested, the wheat then has to be removed from the chaff. And so the way that is done is done on a threshing floor. The threshing floor usually would be where the wheat in the chaff would be placed. And to get the wheat out, they would use leather belts on the threshing floor. And they would beat that wheat, beat it until the kernel of wheat would be separated from the chaff. And then they would take uh, uh, like a basket instrument, like a fan, and throw that thing up, and the chaff would be separated from the wheat. They would usually have uh, a wind blowing to move the chaff as they harvested the wheat. For, for you to have revelation knowledge operating in your life, which is a type of wheat, or to walk in a high level of understanding, which is a type of wheat, the ground has to be prepared, the wheat has to be grown, has to be harvested, has to be beaten, and then has to be ground. Jesus said, if you fall on the rock, 
uh, it's your goodwill to do so. But the rock will fall on you and grind you to powder. And so the grinding of a wheat kernel is very important. And so the wheat is ground into powder and made flour. And then after that, you then have to mix a dough. And then that dough has to be beat into subjection. Then the dough is then taken and put into the oven. And uh, here you go again. It's heat and trouble and uh, uh, exertion of pressure. The, the heat then causes the bread, the bread to bake. And then when the bread is ready, then you can be in the hands of Jesus and feed 5,000. Then you can be ready at midnight to give somebody uh, bread who is begging because of the process. Now, please understand me. Uh, when, when you are being baked as a whole loaf, it takes a long time for you to be baked as a whole loaf just so that you can be broken again and distributed to so many. And so I pray that your process in becoming wheat is, uh, and becoming a loaf is, is possessing your soul in patience. And then also in the making of bread, there's the issue of leaven, which is yeast. Usually when the flour is ready, they then would pour the yeast in, knead the bread, and then allow the yeast to take over that bread. It would then grow into an experience, and then the bread would be baked. So let's deal with leaven. Leaven. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew uh, 13, verse 33, another parable he spoke unto them, is the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of wheat, or of flour, uh, outer court, holy place, holiest of holies, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And so that leaven is placed in there. And of course, then Jesus begins to explain what that leaven is. He tells us, Number one, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 6 through 13, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So there's the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That leaven is hypocrisy. Jesus says in Luke chapter 12 and verse 1, in the meantime when they were gathered together, so many people were there together, they were just almost trampling one another. The disciples began to say to Jesus, uh, what do you mean by the leaven of the Pharisees? Jesus says, the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. And so hypocrisy is leaven. A hypocrite is somebody is, that has two faces. It's uh, the Greek word hypocrates. And so it, a person wearing a mask. Hypocrisy is when a person wears a mask. You see them this way in one place. They are a different person in another place. They are two people. That's what the Pharisees were. They were leaven. They were two people, one in public and then a different person in another place. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. The leaven of the Sadducees, Matthew chapter 22, verse 23, the same day the Sadducees came to him and they were the ones that said there is no resurrection. So the leaven of the Sadducees is to deny the supernatural. Acts chapter 23 and verse 8. But the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, there is no angel, there is no spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So the leaven of the Sadducees is people that deny the supernatural. Those that say that the fivefold ministry does not exist. Those that say that there's no such thing as rank. Those that say there's no such thing as miracles. Those that claim that God doesn't work uh, signs and wonders today. That's the leaven of the Sadducees. They deny the supernatural. And any time you have that kind of leaven, you must make sure you flee from that because Jesus said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you start hanging with people, they start criticizing the supernatural and start criticizing your spiritual experience and talk down on the fact that you speak in tongues and talk down that you worship God in the way you do, that's the leaven of the Sadducees. You need to break relationships with those people because that leaven will get on you. And sooner or later, you will start going to church, the church you attend, and you start finding fault because you'll be looking through the lens of a Sadducee. The third leaven is the leaven of, the leaven of Herod. Mark chapter number 8, verse 15 and 16. 
he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Is it because we brought no bread? The leaven of Herod is uh, the leaven to kill the anointing. Because all the Herods, from the first Herod we read that was killing babies uh, when Jesus was born, to the Herod in chapter number 12 of Acts that killed James and tried to kill Peter, all the Herods and the, one in, the ones in between, Herod that took his brother's wife and uh, wanted Salome to dance for him, and she said, give me John the Baptist's head as a gift because I'll give you half the kingdom. All the Herods kill the anointing. They can't handle the anointing. And any time you have the leaven of Herod uh, rise up, it's because he doesn't like anointing. You'll even see it in Pentecostal churches, even in a church like ours, where we shut down the anointing. We shut down the supernatural. And yes, I know we have to work on time schedules. And yes, I know that we've got to get, you know, move people on to get into their cars so we can make space for the next service and to allow people to find a parking, all of that. And so in my mind, when we're doing all of that, I want to make sure that we're not uh, substituting that and impo imposing the leaven of Herod and killing the anointing and killing a miracle or killing a breakthrough or killing somebody's elevation. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of Herod. It's a killer. The fourth leaven in the Bible is the leaven that you find in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6. Jesus is, uh, Paul is saying, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. He says, purge out the old leaven and get a new lump that you might be unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The leaven of Corinth was sexual perversion. He was telling them, flee sexual perversion. He said, I can't believe that one of you, one of you is, is even sleeping with your mother-in-law. He's telling them, get rid of that leaven. Purify yourselves. Get rid of sexual perversion. Pornography is killing the body of Christ around the world. I pray that God would cleanse. I was looking at a statistic that came during the shutdown. Pornography in the United States is up by 88%. And a lot of it are Christian believers. Let's purge ourselves and get rid of that leaven. And the last leaven is the leaven of Galatia, where Paul was saying, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, which is Galatians chapter number 6. And verse 9, and that level is legalism, where legalism is control and witchcraft, where you want to control somebody and dominate somebody and impose rules on people. We're not going to do that. We expect you to live your Christian life as a mature person, to make godly decisions, to walk uprightly before the Lord. I pray that all the leaven is removed from your life, that you'll walk in the processes of the kingdom of God, that yes, your heart is circumcised, and that yes, as your, your heart is circumcised and you are walking in the kingdom of God, that you experience new wine, you become a new wine skin, and that the oil and anointing on your life as a crushed olive will bless the lives of many, and lastly, that you'll be a loaf without leaven that many will be blessed by. Thank you for being with me at this service today. We so enjoyed bringing it to you. I pray that you'll walk in the process of the kingdom and let these processes be uh, revived and renewed as you grow in newness of life. Uh, from Harare, New Life Covenant Church, we love you guys. We so appreciate your uh, support. And uh, listen, guys, keep your hands washed and stay clean. Love one another. Grow in Christ and receive the rewards of the kingdom of God. We love you very much. God bless you. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for
To get other powerful messages, visit our online store on www.jabulanlcc.org or call plus 263-4-7002 up to 2.